Hi, everybody. My name is Selena. I'm starting this channel talking about all the different things, my own commentary, um, while also just um, presenting facts. So, you know, I'm going to be giving the facts while keeping my opinions clear. So this isn't actually supposed to be my first video. My first video is supposed to be about the whole hype adore controversy. I was actually already editing that one, but this came up and I felt like it was something more important to be talked about. So I kind of put that video on the back burner and I'm going to focus on finishing this one. What we're going to be talking about today is something very tragic that happened and it is what we call the burning sun scandal this happened a couple of years ago in south korea i don't really like the term scandal that is used because it's not a scandal it's a crime the bbc has just released a documentary on the burning sun cases so for those of you who don't really know too much the Burning Sun is basically a case about very well-known K-pop idols being charged for drug, rape, and humiliation of women. These women even included their own female fans. To kind of give you a clue about what kind of men these were, besides, obviously, the crimes I listed, there were these chats in the documentary that reflect real chats that were sent in real life so if you don't know in korea they use kakao talk that is their messaging app of choice in the very beginning of the documentary they kind of show you an animation of one of those chats so we see somebody named kim they send a video we don't really know what's in the video somebody replies we call him ho H-E-O, ho. He just says, he he. Choi, huh? She's completely passed out. Kim, so what if she's out of it? Choi, send me a clip, oh girl, that's alive. Before we really get into what's in the documentary, I want to make some comments. So we talked a little bit before about how the hype and adore situation is going down. Many people for some reason, decided to take this documentary about very serious crimes and accuse it to be hype media play. So they're trying to claim that hype is has somehow had the power to publish this documentary on this day amidst their trouble to kind of take attention off of them i don't know how people can say these things without hearing how ridiculous they sound and even if you think it like that's your initial thought maybe it came from a place of like anger or just like frustration at the situation how do you post that on the internet how do you continue to defend that thought how do you not think about the women who were hurt these are real people. These are real crimes. It's not some stupid K-pop company versus K-pop company bullshit. And documentaries took a lot of work, especially this one, since it is BBC making it. It's not like a domestically made documentary. They had to get probably all these like travel visa, some translators. They don't have anyone on their staff who can speak Korean. They had to contact investigators. They had to uh, dig up information. They had B-roll footage. It's just so much work for you to claim that is being used for media play. Further, considering that today, Min Hee Jin made that statement that kind of implied that hype executives do engage in prostitution. It could be said that more like she leaned, in, leaned into the media play. Like, I don't believe it. I'm not saying that's what happened. I'm saying that would make if it was to happen, if somebody did do media play with this documentary, it is more likely to be Minhejin. Prostitution came out of nowhere in her accusation today. 
Never once had she ever hinted at it before, but suddenly today she decides to imply that Hive executives engage in prostitution on the day that this documentary about sex crimes is released. <laughs> Again, before talking about what's in the documentary, I want to talk about some um, notes I have on how well made the documentary itself is. So... In the documentary, they do have some people who were interviewed who wanted to remain anonymous. And they used some very artistic ways to visually disguise these people. I was very fascinated the first time I watched it. I was like, wow, this is chef's kiss. Amazing. (laughs) So the director of photography is also the producer and the director who is Kai Lawrence. For those of you who don't want to watch the documentary because it can be triggering, I am going to share with you screenshots of what I mean about how they were artistically remained anonymous. Okay, so here what we have is one of the workers from the club who decided to be interviewed as long as he remained anonymous. You could see here though, like just the slightest light in the background and it's just all dark and like almost creepy. And since he is one of the former workers of the club who knew what was going on and actively participated in it, I feel like this kind of ominous vibe is very telling of his part in the crimes. Here is another worker, and I really like this because it shows kind of, to me, like the dark side of South Korea. You can see all the city lights reflected there, and it looks so pretty. But what is being said is very scary and here we have a victim and you can see the difference in the way she is portrayed and in the way they are portrayed they are portrayed in the dark they are portrayed as almost ominous people and she her background is kind of like almost healing in a way we have the greens and the plants but also we have some kind of like i want to say it looks like dirt but probably isn't dirt um like splotches here that makes you feel like there's something sad happening basically and we're looking at her through a door it almost looks like she's not aware that we're watching her right now and that will really tie in to the rest of the things we were here about in this documentary i also like that they don't just keep this shot on her i think for these two they don't change any angles it's always just like when they're talking it they look like this but for her they also give her this kind of like back view And you're looking outside towards the apartments, towards the light. And again, with the plants. In the documentary, there's actually footage of acts of violence that I have never seen before. So I was into K-pop and I was actively on Twitter at the time that this was happening. And to see these videos, I think for me, was kind of like pulling me back into that time of when it was happening, but making me more aware of what happened to these women. So trigger warning, because I am going to describe three videos that were in the documentary. So there's one video of Jung, who we will learn who he is later, putting his hand up a woman's skirt, and you can kind of see her trying to like push his hand away. And he's just like insisting, just keeps pulling it. At some point, she doesn't 
fight it anymore. She's just like, whatever. But from the atmosphere, it kind of looks like they're at a dinner with some friends. So for me, it seems like she's like, oh no, if I keep struggling, someone's going to notice. He has his hand up this woman's skirt and he's all smiley and almost bubbly. And he's recording this video and he's like, Kinko ya. So he's like calling up to his friend. There is another video of Jung again and his friend Choi basically pushing a girl to drink more and more and more and more and kind of Jung is encouraging Choi to kiss this girl even though at this point she probably can't even really consent and he's like oh that was so sexy do it again Choi yeah keep doing it Choi and the third video I'm going to tell you guys about is actually a video of Sungri and he is at a party with a woman and he's pulling this woman by her arm yelling at her and she's kind of like holding onto a table to prevent from being dragged along there's actually somebody sitting at that table and they're just like keeping their head down like if i don't see it i'm not part of the problem if i don't see it it's not about me if i don't see it it's not my fault if she gets hurt. Another thing I wanted to touch upon is the beef footage in the documentary. It actually contains footage of Le Meridian Hotel. That is the hotel where the Burning Sun Club was located. The hotel has since been neglected and abandoned. So the footage looks very creepy like have you ever seen tiktok videos about like abandoned houses or abandoned malls or stuff like that that's the vibe it's giving here's some screenshots i took of kind of how the building looked at the time they were recording for b footage very creepy abandoned broken and even just like the club where the club was itself looked really almost like underground serial killer lair vibes there's actually going to be a new building built where the hotel was so it's actually going to be torn down let me pull up the article so here's the article we have a rendered image of how the building is supposed to look like once it's built i'm not going to read it so just going to go into some of what we're going to go over. This is a rendered image of the lower structures. Looks cool. It's like steps. Interesting. This is supposed to be how it's going to look on the inside. I also want to note on the background music of the documentary. So it comes in very strong with these like low violets. I guess I think it would come call them low and immediately it puts you on edge and you're like oh no something's going to happen so it really sets the scene for the terrible things we are going to learn that happened in the club or just not even not even only in the club even outside the club the music is original and it was made by jason luxton so i just really wanted to throw in my praises to him for the music so to really understand everything we need to go over this korean term that is brought up again and again and again in the documentary what is morka morka is a huge problem in south korea japan and other countries but the term morka is actually unique to korean so morka is short for more camera more camera more sneaky or like stealthy an adverb, right? Kamera is the Konglish word for camera. I'm going to say Konglish because maybe there is a native Korean word for camera, but in this case, they're using kamera. Morka is filming or taking pictures of women without their consent with the purpose of embarrassing them 
or to blackmail them. So in America, we call this revenge porn. It can happen anywhere in Korea, from change rooms in the mall to bathrooms and even between relationships. So there is quite a few people mentioned in the documentary. I'm kind of gonna, I'm kind of going to give just a brief introduction on who each person is. I'm really sorry if I butcher names. I haven't spoken Korean in like a hot minute. I'm way better at reading it <laughs> at this point in my life. It's been basically a year since I've lived in Korea and here in the U.S. with my family who speaks Spanish. I have little to like no reason to ever use Korean. I'm going to be taking Korean classes again, but as it stands now, I probably sound like somebody who has never spoken Korean a day in their life. So my bad. So the investigators consist of five people. We have Park Hyo-shil. Hyo-shil is a female reporter. Everything more or less started with her published article back in 2016. Then we have Kang kyung Yoon. She is a female entertainment journalist and she published the article that got all of the men arrested. Then we have Ko Ung sang he is one of the first reporters that began investigating the Burning Sun Club. We have Pang chong Kyun. He is a lawyer in South Korea who was leaked information. He wanted to make it public and that's how he ended up working with Kang kyung Yoon. And then we have Gu Hara. Gu Hara was a member of the K-pop group Kara and also a solo artist. Then we have the perpetrators. There are four perpetrators mentioned in this documentary. There was, I think, a bunch of other men arrested for being involved into this, but these are the main four. So we have Chung Chun Young. He is a singer-songwriter who became popular due to his love ballads. He won many awards and was very popular. Then we have Sungri, arguably the most famous one. He is a member of Big Bang. Big Bang was one of the first K-pop groups to kind of bring global attention to K-pop. Then we have Che Chong Hoon. He is a guitarist and the center for the K-pop rock band FT Island. Then we have who I will call Police Prosecutor General. I'm going to call him that because he is referred to that basically like the whole documentary. We don't really learn his name until the end, but his name is Yun Kyu-gun. The police prosecutor general was basically helping protect sung business in Kim. So there are some texts sent by somebody named Kim. We are never really told in the documentary who Kim is, but Kim sends a message to but who I assume is sung He says, some other bar came and took a shitload of photos of the interior yesterday and snitched. But... The police prosecutor general said they're snitching because they're jealous, so not to worry and that he sorted all out. He he he. So the way I organize this video is by focusing on the different people involved in the documentary, what I believe is their individual stories or events that I believe they were largely responsible for or a part of. So first, we're going to talk about Park Hyo-shil. So Park Hyo-shil is the female reporter who published an article in 2016. What did she publish? So in 2016, she received a tip that Jung Jun Young secretly filmed his GF at the time, and she accused him of murga. She wrote the article and published it on September 23rd in 2016. That was... Eight years ago? I can't do math. Once she published the article, she got attacked by fans of Jong and even men who hate women, basically. They call themselves anti-feminist. She was sent death threats and harassed with phone calls continuously. She was sent obscene images and insults through messengers. She miscarried twice due to all of the abuse and stress going on. But she didn't quit because she felt like if she had quit, the harassers would win. Then after everything was revealed, her report actually gained attention again. And uh, she went on an interview. A lot of people were leaving comments. Those commentators actually apologized to her. And some even admitted to harassing her in the past. 
which like this just confuses me on why people want you to believe korean gp so much in k-pop it's very much a thing that like oh if the koreans say it's bad then it's bad if the koreans say it's good it's good for international fans like they think because they don't understand the language they have to refer to those that do in this case in many cases that is wrong you should look at everything and form your own opinion don't follow what other people think we're going to move on to jong ju young he was the singer songwriter who became popular for singing love ballads or whatever this is him while he's getting arrested because i thought that would be fun photo to share we're gonna just refer to him as chong from now on because it's kind of how he's referred to in the group chats and also i'm not gonna say his name because i told you i'm struggling with korean these days for reals man i need to take classes again in 2016 he filmed his girlfriend they gave her the alias kyung me when they were having sex at his house without her consent is the key here he filmed her without her consent she caught him and reported the incident because she was scared that he would later share the video he gets questioned by police and refuses to give them his phone the police compromise with him and allow him to give his phone to a private forensic company instead of like the police directly checking the phone i don't know why i don't know how you could even justify that whatever so jung's lawyer actually calls the private forensic company and tells them to just say that they couldn't recover what i assume is the video of kyungmi from jung's phone the lawyer says in a recording that is shown in the documentary between him and the forensic company that the police themselves want the video not to be found because they want to rush through the case. They don't think the case is necessary. It's not important. They literally called it an unnecessary legal case. At this time, Jung is also part of a reality show called two days and one night a lawyer from the show calls kyung mi and threatens her he tells her if there is not sufficient evidence if there's not enough evidence to prove that he committed morka you're going to get charged and punished for a false accusation she gets scared understandably so and decides to drop the case and then she publicly apologizes to jung Jung holds a press conference to clear his name. He even says something like, I could never imagine this something that happened between us as a joke would like ruin my life like this or something like that. After the press conference, Jung is actually seen as a victim. The data from Jung's phone is never checked until 2019 when somebody who had access to that data leaks it. There's a text threat shown in the documentary for texts sent back to back by Jung, where he says, now all the horse working in bars look dirty. Until recently, they were my toys. Now they're like trash. We're going to go to the next man, Choi Jung Hoon. He is the member and guitarist and center from FT Island. According to the documentary, he didn't really initiate things, but he did follow along and he really obeyed Sumri. So everything Sumri told him to do, he would do it. Choi and Jung invited some of Choi's female friends to a ski resort where they drugged the woman. This was shown in the cacao talks. They said, I can't remember anything that happened. Videos and photos were shared in the group chat with the men of Choi's female friends who appeared to be drugged and they were being assaulted. In March of 2016, Jung actually held a fan sign in Daegu. The next day, a woman was reported to have been drugged and assaulted while unconscious. 
we find out that she was actually assaulted by both Chang and Choi with other people from the group chat present. They show you some text messages exchanged regarding the Daegu fan sign. There's a man, Kwan. He said, did you get a taste of some Daegu whores yesterday? Jung replies, literally the funniest light of my entire life. Kim, haha, oh boy. Jung sends an audio message, then sends another message. He says, hey Kim, we got caught because you turned the fucking flash on. Why the fuck did you turn the flash on, haha? <laughs> Ah, uh, fuck, it was fucking hilarious. Another man called Park sent the message. Oh, I got so scared yesterday thinking that the girl had a real concussion. Sound of her skull cracking when she fell. Brother Jung and I were really surprised. Jung sends a laughing emoji. I put this event under Choi's name, even though it was Jung's fan sign and Jung's fan. And honestly, I out of all of them, Jung is... The most heinous because this is really the worst crime that Choi commits and it really is what leads him to helping the investigation later and we're gonna talk about Sungri so Sungri is a member of the very popular k-pop band Big Bang he was very successful at a young age and was known as a party animal. He likened himself the Jay Gatsby of South Korea. He had huge parties that were promoted and edited. And like, oh, Singri's parties, Singri's parties. Like, duh, 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 duh. it says in the documentary that he named himself Sungspi, like Singri Gatsby. Sung's being just so late. <laughs> in 2015, he holds a birthday party and invites investors. There are some texts shown that I assume happened before the party. So Sungri says, This birthday party is crucial to spark things up for next year. So please, everyone, be aware of that. If you get into trouble, fuck. Jung says, Don't be nervous. Haha. <laughs> Sungri. You'll make me nervous when I think of you darting your tongue out kissing in the club. There are some other texts that are shown that I assume happened during the party. Sungri, seems like K has guests from Taiwan. Kim, I'll take good care of them. Sungri, yeah, and the girls get ones that give it good. Kim, I'm inviting low-grade girls for now. Somebody comes in named you. I'm arranging prostitutes now, so when the two prostitutes arrive, Kim, you lead them and make sure they get to the hotel fine. We can see from these text messages that these women are being used as tools to secure business deals. Later, with his friends, Sungri opens a drinking place called Miltang Pocha. A few days after it's open, Jong is already sharing Molka from the bar with a different friend. Jung sends a text. He says, it's bloody hilarious that I fucking shagged her on the third floor corridor, recorded the whole fuck. And he sends a photo of a girl lying on the floor. In 2018, Burning Sun opens. The Burning Sun rates, I guess you could call them, are freaking crazy. So a VIB table at Burning Sun could cost up to $10,000 during regular operations and $75,000 for special events like Halloween and Christmas. The club used MDs or merchandisers to deliver women to VIPs. Two male employees agreed to be interviewed and they talk about the club. They said they would take pictures of pretty girls without permission and send them to VIPs. They stated that GHB was used a lot in the club, mainly in VIP rooms where no sound could be heard from the outside. They also stated that if a VIP member picked a specific girl, anything was done to deliver that girl to the VIP. There were some texts shown between two merchandisers. MD1, the VIP is looking for a hot girl. MD2, okay, looking for one now. MD1, he's chasing me. Help me find one quick. Don't need a hot girl anymore. Just looking for one that looks out of it. 
MD2. Okay. We'll look for one of those then. MD1. Help me hit a home run. An interview by the victim that we saw how she was portrayed earlier in the video. We'll call them Woman A. She comes forward with her story in the documentary. She used to be a frequent visitor of the club. One time while she was at the club, she felt like she was getting drunk too quickly and told her friend, oh, I'm not going to drink anymore. Then she wakes up in a hotel room and she doesn't remember anything that happened in between her being in the bathroom with her friend and her waking up in the hotel room. I'm going to give a trigger warning for the description of her assault. So when she wakes up in the hotel room, there is a man there. And the man is the man who was giving her drinks at the club. When he sees that she is awake, he pins her down to the bed. He sits on her chest and covers her mouth. He keeps pushing her down to the bed. She describes it like when you're giving CPR to someone, you know, like that. So that's how he's pushing her to the bed. She tries to escape, but she is in pain from the weight of him on her ribs. And she really feels like he might kill her. So she just gives up. And afterwards, she begs him to let her go home. He didn't let her go home until he took a picture of her happy. She couldn't smile. So then she just made a peace sign. Later, when she accused him of rape, he used a photo of her as evidence that the sex was consensual. He wasn't charged and he was able to leave Korea. So I'm assuming that man is a foreigner and he's out there somewhere. The thing with Sungri's club, Burning Sun, is that the police would never enter the club whenever it was called for incidents. They would get paid by the club staff to not interfere and to cover up the incident. So this kind of backfired to them in 2019. A CCTV footage was broadcasted on the news of a man back in 2018 getting beaten by club staff. And the police is right there watching him getting beaten and not doing anything about it. After he gets beaten, they actually arrest the man instead. And I think I remember when this was released that Burning Sun actually tried to claim him as an assaulter. They're like, oh, we kicked him out because he assaulted a woman. I remember that being the case, but correct me if I'm wrong. In the coming days, there would be two other damning footages released surrounding Burning Sun. There was one released footage that shows a woman being dragged by club staff in the club. And there's also a morgue that is released that was filmed in Burning Sun. It is called the Red Bathroom video. They don't show it in the documentary. With these videos being released basically back to back, the club closes down. And Sungri actually makes a statement to his fans during his solo concert about how all of these things have happened because of his shortcomings and because he wasn't humble enough and blah, 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 blah. We have Kang Kyung Yun. So she is the reporter of the article that actually gets these three men arrested. So in 2019, she receives the Kakao Talk messages from Jung's phone data. These Kakao Talk messages are from 2015 to 2016. She then begins her investigation. While investigating, she finds out that somebody with police influence is helping them. So that is the police prosecutor general that I think I've mentioned before. She finds this out because in the messages, it is revealed that Choi was called drunk driving by a police officer, but the police officer protected him. Kang actually did have some doubts about reporting the Kakao group chat because she did see how Park Yoshid was attacked. So it is understandable. She was also pregnant at the time. And when she was investigating, she was hiding the investigation from her husband. Dealing with very, very harsh morning sickness. 
Kang decides to release the story about the group chats after all of those released CCTV footages came out. So she talks to her company, SBS, and they agree that they should start their reveal by publishing a story on how Sungri contracted prostitutes for club investors. He goes in voluntarily for questioning and he's questioned for nine hours. While that's happening, people are trying to figure out whose phone the evidence was from. In the article, they, they say, oh, Sungri contracted prostitutes for club investors as revealed in a celebrity's phone. They don't name the celebrity, so GP is kind of like trying to figure out who it is. Obviously, reporter Kang knows whose phone it is, so she's not focused on that. Instead, she's focused on trying to figure out who the police prosecutor general is. Once she finds out who the police prosecutor general is, she publishes another article which leads to the men getting arrested. After the article was published, many women who had hung out with Sungri Choi and Jung contacted Kang and lawyer Pang. Since JHB was involved, many of these women had no idea if they were actually assaulted or not. So they asked them, oh, am I in that group chat? Was it shared? One of those women who came forward to Kang and lawyer Bang is the fan from Jung's Deku fan sign. When Kang was able to confirm to her that she was assaulted, she decided to press charges. There was a total of seven victims who came forward and decided to press charges against these men. We're going to move on to the last two people that are talked about and play a major part in this documentary, which is Gu Hara and Gu Hoin. Gu Hara is the member of the K-pop group Kara, and then Gu Hoyin is her brother. So Hara was actually a victim herself of revenge porn. Her ex-boyfriend threatened to release photos of her that were taken without her consent when she was at the height of her fame. We actually see CCTV footage of her begging on her knees while her boyfriend is in the elevator going like, please, please don't share those photos. She knows that those photos could ruin her career. That boyfriend was later convicted for assault and blackmail. So how does Guhara get involved in this case? Guhara actually called reporter Kang herself and offered to help. Hara has been friends with Choi since she was a trainee, basically. So they've been friends for a very long time. And she also knew Sungri and Jung. She told reporter Kang that she has seen them on their mobile phones and that they have some weird stuff on there. So she was suspicious of them. So Hara wanted to find out how she could help Kang. And Kang asked her for help on finding out who was the police prosecutor general. Hara actually called Choi and told him, Oh, I can help you help yourself, basically, if you talk to reporter Kang. Her brother Hoin was present when Hara was talking to Choi. She was talking to him on the speakerphone. So Choi does contact reporter Kang and reporter Kang records the phone call. In the phone call, Choi identifies PPG as Yoon Kyu Kun, Kun? Yoon Kyu Kun. And as we know, when she has the identification of Police Prosecutor General Reporter Kong publishes her article. At the time of this going down, Gu Hara's friend, fellow K-pop idol Suri, actually commits suicide. After she learns of her friend's suicide, she goes on IG Live and is crying her eyes out. Suri, I will make it to your funeral no matter what. While she's on IG Live, she's actually harassed for going on IG Live being accused of using her friend's suicide to increase her fame. I think all of these events together, her friend that she's known for a very long time, not being who she thought she was, the other two men who she was friends with also doing terrible things, her friends really committing suicide and getting harassed by people. All of these just 
overwhelmed her and she would also commit suicide. Her brother says that her last post on IG is an all black photo with the word goodnight in the caption. After her funeral, Hoyin's wife actually reveals that she was pregnant and Hoyin expresses that he really thinks that being an aunt would have been a wish come true for Hara. So he was like, if she had just held on for a few more days, I think it would have really helped her. So what is the aftermath? Jung is sentenced to six years for the rape in Daegu and Molka. He was actually released March of this year. Choi is sentenced to two and a half years for the rape in Daegu. The PPG was acquitted of all charges. Sungri was sentenced to 18 months on appeal for her contracting prostitutes, embezzlement, murga, and exciting violence. The club staff who came forward in the documentary said that the use of GHB is still happening in the clubs they work at today. Ooh, I didn't. So I had watched this documentary two times, first time, just to kind of um, watch it with no distractions get all the details in and then the second time I watched it taking notes and then doing this was like watching it a third time so I really didn't expect to cry again but I did I think what we as people not k-pop stands just people have to do is take what is seriously what is serious seriously and not use it for fan wars and plagiarism claims and media play claims and all that that all that at the end of the day is just bullshit petty petty bullshit the burning sun cases are not media play there are crimes that happen to real people real women who have been violated and may never feel the same, may never heal. Korea is just like any other country. There is very dark things that happen in Korea. It just doesn't get reported as much, especially in Korea being such a patriarchal society. Women are believed less there than they are here. The charges against sexual assault and rape and mulka are actually not taken, are not that heavy at all for what the crime is. Women in Korea are very strong and I hope they're able to find justice and equality. And with that, I'm going to say goodbye. I'm really sad. <laughs> I still have to edit this video.